This film is about Western Port. Western Port is an area situated to the southeast of Melbourne, along the southern coast of Victoria. This is an area of almost unique diversity. 70% of all the plant and animal life that is native to Victoria is found in Western Port. It also supports valuable shipping, valuable farming, an enormous amount of recreational activities, including fishing and all sorts of other water things. And it's the most popular area in the state. The main tourist road in Victoria runs right down the side of Western Port to the Penguins at Phillip Island. If you've ever been to the Penguins, you've been to Western Port. It's a fabulous natural wonderland, and like a lot of other fabulous natural wonderlands in the world, it is now in a bit of trouble. What we used to have in the clear water were millions of fish, sea dragons, corals and sponge gardens. Now we've got a problem. The water has become turbid, the seagrass has died off and the mangroves have died off. The causes of these things are runoff from the farms through the creeks, sediment carried from the catchment into Western Port Bay, sediment smothers the seagrass, the sediment starves the seabed of light and the plants can't photosynthesize. The cure is to slow the flow of the streams, to plant seagrasses and to plant mangroves. But let's go back to the beginning. The bay was formed when 10,000 years ago water rushed in from Bass Strait to fill what was called a sunk land. About a third of the bay is uh, made up of intertidal mudflats, which simply means that when the tide is out, about a third of the bay is mud. It therefore is a wonderful habitat for birds, principally uh, water birds, many of which are migratory. We're going to be going under the water and we're going to be looking at these beautiful plants and animals that live in the marine world of Western Port. We're also going to look at the land around the bay. The land is the catchment in which the rain falls which runs into the bay. There have always been changes in Western Port. In 1975 a major study was done into the status of the bay. At that time, uh, it was one of the largest pristine bodies of water anywhere in the world near a major metropolitan centre. The study was called the Shapiro Report, and it warned of the dangers that were likely to be encountered in the next few years. A lot of those dangers were not heard properly, and a lot of those problems now exist. Furthermore, there is an enormous suburban growth corridor right down across the top of Western Port which puts enormous pressure on what is very low-lying land. There are some significant human-made problems in Western Port and we're going to have to address them. There are things we can do. We're going to hear about all those. So put the kettle on. Here we go. It's, it's rich with seagrass beds and sea dragons and sheltered bays with amazing lamp shells and all sorts of creatures are living in this great bay. There's just an amazing variety of plants and animals and birds and fish and, and, and landscapes and types of soil. So, uh, we're very fortunate to have that, and it's a very unique and wonderful part of Victoria. But it's also a bay that has a lot of human influence on it, so we do make an impact with the runoff that comes out of the rivers and the creeks, and the boating activities, and the different things we do in Western Port have an impact. It's been fundamentally sort of changed in the early 1900s and then again the middle 1900s, it was like a big green sponge. It had all these rivers draining all their water, but it was all slowed down in this massive tea tree and other plant life um, before it got to the bay. Well, we chose to remove all that. Clearing the Coo up swamp must definitely have had a big effect depositing all this silt on it. We've not only lost that freshwater swamp, possibly the largest in the Southern Hemisphere, we've fundamentally changed the ecosystem because we know those clay banks, that clay shoreline, 
is eroding dramatically. Is it? Yeah, that, that contributes about 30% of the fine sediment into that whole northern area of Western Port. I've measured a metre a year being eroded away, and that's all good salt marsh habitat that orange-bellied par parrot could use. Sea levels have been rising throughout the 20th century. They rose at about a rate of one to two millimetres per year. Just in the last 15 or so years, the rate has increased to about three millimetres per year globally. The black swans are, um, are herbivores, so they, they eat plant material and they eat seagrass, which is a very important part of the functioning of, of the ecosystem of Western Port. And we've, we certainly have, we know we've got a lot less seagrass in Western Port. I've been working with Landcare in, in this region for 10 years. And well, I know from a child, I, I remember when the water quality changed in Western Port. I remember looking in the water and thinking, what's, what's going on? Why is the, the water so murky and muddy? And um, here I am 20, 30 years later, trying to do something about it. If you look at a map of uh, Australia in 1800, you'll see the big gap where Victoria is. Nobody knew what was here until basically George Bass was sent from Sydney to see if there was a port to the west of Sydney and he came right round here and discovered there was one, which is why this is called Western Port, even though it's slightly to the east of Port Phillip Bay, which had of course yet to be discovered at that time. There were people living here, there were Aboriginal communities right around here of the Bunurong people and they lived off shellfish and from birds and from plant life and there are middens all over Western Port. Well, if you talk about Western Port, you have to think about the catchment, the land on which the rain falls and the water drains into Western Port. And that catchment is some 350,000 hectares in area. In geological terms, uh, it's a sunk land. The, some many thousands of years ago, that part of Victoria sank under geological and earthquake activity. And then the sea level rose and all that area got flooded with water. And it goes all the way up to the forested hills in the Bunyip State Park, mm. right? And it, it encompasses, of course, very significantly, a very large central area of that catchment was at one time the Kuwirup Swamp. It was a barrier to people moving from the northern part of the state, particularly Melbourne and, and the Monita Peninsula, around to South Gippsland. Being, you know, saturated soils, they, they were very rich in nutrients and um, sediments from, you know, hundreds of thousands of years probably of deposits of soil from the upper catchment, mm. coupled with water being a very rich environment to um, to farm was, was the attitude and that they all they had to do was get a, get a bit of the water away so they drained it. And it was drained about by the end of the 19th century and it has now resulted in the Kuiwap land now being some of the most productive and wealthiest agricultural land in Victoria. But we've also got as a consequence a very significant input of sediment and soil coming into the bay. Yeah. Some 70% of that soil particles which come in with the seepage of water from the main drain comes from agricultural land. The other 30%, interestingly enough, comes from soil erosion around the cliffs, particularly in the northeast part of the bay. This is around the top of French Island. In this area, the tide never quite flushes properly because it meets itself coming the other way. The tide wraps itself around French Island and as a result, any sediment in the water never quite settles. A study showed that suspended sediment uh, is in the order of about 60,000 tonnes a year from the five major feeder streams. This has probably been consistent over the last century. So 60,000 tonnes of sediment that go into that northern and eastern western port zone that probably didn't reach there before when the swamp was in existence. I think that the draining of the Kuirup swamp, you know, back sort of halfway through the last century, that the environment's response to that has been 
incredibly slow. Now, anecdotal evidence, I was speaking to um, an Indigenous spokesperson at the end of last year, and he said, ah, Auntie Ida told me that back in 1967 she used to collect little mollusks from on the seagrass. So you could walk on the seagrass mm. in the 60s. But she'd noticed then that the little mollusks had lost their luster. Yeah. Now that's a nutrient response. But that's what you would anticipate, that we actually disrupted the nutrient cycling by changing the way the fresh water got to the bay. Talking to the earliest divers in Western Port Bay, they say 35 years ago the visibility was much better. Um, if you go back even 100 years before that, they were draining the Kuirup Swamp, which was a huge salt marsh area that used to trap all the, the grit and sand that get, got run off in rivers and floods and whenever there were storms, it acted as a trap to stop too much sediment coming in. Now, that was drained, it's been turned into farms with big kind of channels down the middle of them. So if you get storms or earth clearing or there's no vegetation, all this sediment rushes down and gets dumped over the top of the seagrass meadows, the sponge gardens, all the creatures that live in Western Port. And so if you look over a 100 or 150 year time span, there's been enormous changes in the pressures on that system and the amount of silt that's in that water. And most of the time, for most of Western Port, it looks like coffee. And that coffee is all the fine silt sediment that is coming as just rain. It's being rained down on all the animals mm. coming in with all the water flow. Satellite photographs show that the northeast of the bay, there's sediment everywhere there. It's washing off the, the Lang Lang Cliffs. And that, and that just deposits on the seagrass. So I've tried to grow seagrass up there and it just gets smothered by a slimy brown material and, and it just won't grow. All this material here is silt from the erosion of these cliffs. The cliffs are made of very crumbly and friable material and there's nothing whatever to protect them. So when the tide comes in, the water comes right up over these cliffs and up into this salt marsh. In 10 years, none of this will be here. Those cliffs are eroding quite rapidly at the moment, about one metre per year mm. going back. And the fact that the water is now much muddier than it used to be is almost certainly the cause of the loss of all the seagrass in Western Port. The same thing has happened in West Australia, in South Australia and in Queensland. Everyone has now concluded that the main causative factor in causing loss of seagrass was the increased turbidity from soil erosion. And turbidity <coughs> is, the, is the lack of clarity in the sea? Yeah, that's right. All plants require sunlight. They use the sunlight energy to turn carbon dioxide into sugars and plant material. If the water is turbid, that cuts back the amount of sunlight reaching the bottom where the seagrasses are growing. That means that they are starved of sunlight and they never get going. So that's uh, the reason why the sediment is not a good thing. And that sediment, unfortunately, just doesn't settle to the bottom and stay there. The, the constant gentle movement of water around the top of French Island in a clockwise direction is moving that very fine mud all the time and mm. the water remains turbid because of tide action. One of the major things is it's the nursery for whiting. Whiting breed over near the South Australian border and, and, the, and the larvae come along on the currents and they come into all the inlets. And they, as I understand it, they seek out seagrass and they grow for a year or so in the seagrass. So, so they, they need that as a habitat. Swans spread themselves out over the seagrass beds and they, they actually, I, I believe they actively deplete them so that by the end of March um, and April, they, I think in some areas the swans have actually just about worked the whole seagrass beds over. And th this means that their numbers are actually quite closely related to the, to the uh, area of seagrass. But it also highlights just how important their role is in getting the nutrient cycling of, of Western Port um, moving along because um, Western Port is what we call a, a detritus-based system. It depends on the seagrass fixing the energy and, and, and through its growth and then it's, it's dying and it's, it's being broken off by swans. It forms a sort of this detritus, this material that most of the animals in the, in the mud in, in the ecosystem survive on. So it's kind of the powerhouse 
of of mm. the thing. It's the trees of the forest, if you like, in uh, in other in other habitats. And swans have this great role in they break off the seagrass, they eat some of it, but they cause a lot of it to drift away, and that that rots down and becomes this very important food for all the invertebrates in the in the mud. In in Western Port, the seagrasses grow using sunlight. There's seaweeds that live there, there's little planktonic animals, there's all sorts of filter feeders. So the sponges and the corals and the sea squirts are all sucking um, animal and plant remains out of the water. They're sort of filtering it constantly. And then there's little crabs and sea spiders and snails that feed on those. And then there's fish that feed on those. And then there's penguins and seals and all sorts of other animals coming up the food chain. Sharks move into the bay. They even see killer whales at seal rocks off Phillip Island. So everything is covered in that one area. Now it's a very different story. The fishery catches have gone right down mm. and the seagrasses have largely disappeared. They're coming back in spots here and there. Mm. But as long as there's continued input of sediment, it's going to be very hard for them to recover. What we do know is that climate change is forcing nature, forcing ecosystems places they've never ever been before. And we don't understand them now, let alone where we're pushing them to. So, I mean, we're really doing, we're really changing the climate and changing those things that support us as a species and our, in, and our, and our economy in, in parallel, we're forcing them to our peril. Typically what we're finding is that um, by about 2070, what was typically a one in 100 year event under current climate conditions, tends to suddenly become a less than one in 10 year event. Mm -hmm. So. Now that's not to say we're going to be getting the storms much more frequently, it's just that a much weaker storm surge event has greater impact because the sea levels are much higher. One of the important things people have to remember with sea level rise is that, particularly on a sandy shoreline, a soft shoreline, a vertical sea level rise of say a metre can lead to 50 to 100 times the shoreline recession and that's because the shoreline is no longer in equilibrium with that particular sea level so it erodes and so you get you know wave attack higher up the beach it takes sand offshore and so the erosion will be um, much greater than the vertical sea level rise. So with the sea level rising and the shoreline completely unprotected because the mangroves were removed we need to get planting. We, we believe that the only way to stop that effectively happening is to re-establish the mangrove forests that used to effectively cover most of the coastline of Western Port. Many of those forests of mangroves have disappeared for all sorts of reasons and causes, including even in the 19th century, they extensively harvested them and burnt the timber to give a high potash ash which was used for making shaving soap of all things. Yeah. You can go to Stony Point now and see a mangrove forest which is 200 metres wide and that's what they used to be over most of the bay. Mangroves are an amazing tree, to, they're amazing on a lot of levels. To start with they're living in seawater which would kill most trees or shrubs so mm. they're very good at coping with salt. They live in mud that not far below the surface it runs out of oxygen because it's so dense the oxygen can't penetrate mm. and so they grow these special roots that are like air roots that come up as fingers out of the mud. They're like that asparagus that you Yeah, see. it yeah. looks like asparagus underwater mm. and they're all air breathing roots that allow them to get the gases they need to, to breathe and to photosynthesize up and down to their roots because otherwise the mud they just die straight away mm. and those roots are fantastic because they trap sediment that's in the in the water it falls down amongst the roots and it helps bind together the mud so when the current's screaming past the mangroves are actually stopping all that mud being lifted up into the water again yeah. where it can cause all this sort of dirty water and problems for other plants but they do other incredible things the way they cope with salt is by concentrating all the salt into one or two leaves at a time and you get this bright yellow leaf that's almost pure salt and then it just breaks the leaf off and drops it on the on the mud so that the rest of the plant's healthy while this one leaf is the little salt factory for them. Mm. The roots and all the, the growth of the plant are fantastic for fish to live in. All sorts of animals live on the roots and the mangroves. All sorts of birds nest and roost in the mangroves. Mm. There's little stork-eyed crabs running around the roots of the mangroves mm. at low tide. They, they just play a really critical role and, and we tend to clear mangroves out to do coastal developments 
and they're what's actually keeping those areas sort of pristine and healthy. It's, it's the nursery grounds for lots of fish, flounder and flathead and uh, the three fish that penguins eat uh, c come from the mangrove. So the, the, the fish that the penguin eats right out there, uh, the penguin doesn't come here to get them, they go out to the penguins. In the midst of all the bad news about the environment, here's some very good news. These students here, who with their teachers are from the Bass Valley Primary School, are working with the estimable Dr Mangrove on replanting programs. See if we can, we can get it established, and then we might be able to take healthy bits from here, spread it around to other places. They're replanting, in some areas, seagrass. They're planting seagrass here. This is a, a patch that's going well. Now that, that was a, a 10 centimetre core and you can see it's, it's quite luxurious now and, and these, uh, it's growing these stolons. When a storm comes these will break off and, and they'll settle somewhere else and grow. So this sort of thing we want to promote in different places. In other areas they're planting mangroves, they're measuring the progress of these plantings, they're noting all the cores that they're planting. They're very often propagating and growing the little plants inside the school in little containers, and then they put them in the sea and they plant them. They plant them in all weathers, and then they go home and their mothers do the washing. Some of the land care groups working in the catchment of Western Port have got a very nice slogan. It's called Slow the Flow. They accept the water has to flow somehow into Western Port. But the more slowly it flows, the more it can sink into the soil, it can be purified as it goes. We're trying to make the levee banks a bit flatter so the river can start to use up its energy, or the drain can use up, use up its energy by meandering in the bottom instead of just rushing through with great oh, power. See. You mean that will slow it down? And... Yep, yep, it'll, it'll, lose, it'll use its energy mm. uh, moving backwards and forwards and hitting against the big rocks that we've put in there and mm. instead of gouging deeper and, uh, and causing slumping of the, of the levees. So we've, we've built a, a really big sediment trap at uh, at the start of the Yallock outfall mm. at Cora Lynn. It's a, it's a big high flow floodway which takes off the Bunyip main drain. So a, a massive sediment trap has been put in there to, to capture... And what's the theory there? What's it supposed to do? It, it'll capture the bed load, right. we're hoping, uh, all the sand and gravel, and it's, uh, I, it's doing a fairly good job as well. Every little bit would help because the water would flow more slowly and that would give the sediment time to settle out on the land itself and not be transported into the bay, waters of the bay. So the water trickling into the bay would then be clean, clear water and not turbid water. It's only very slowly responding. We're just sort of seeing things now in coastal erosion, changes to the tidal channels, changes to the seagrass, a whole lot of stuff we didn't understand when we made those decisions to drain it and understanding of course nowadays the importance of access to fresh water is another, is another issue. How many trees have you planted as a matter of interest? Over the 20 years of land care in this region it's in excess of a million plants just in the bass catchment. Um, there's a probably a quarter of a million to half a million plants been established on Phillip Island and um, probably something similar on French Island there's still a long way to go. And like I said earlier, 7% currently native vegetation cover and we're aiming for a minimum of 30% over time. And um, at the rate we're going at the moment, it's gonna take a really long time. So at some stage, we're gonna to have to amp up the level of activity and, and resources and support made available to people on the land to, to increase their impact on the landscape. I, th I think you get very rapid recovery of the animals and plants in the system if there was more planting to sort of stabilise those beds of mud that just keep getting lifted up every time the currents go by. Um, if, if you can look at things like nutrient runoff and superphosphating on farms in the area, if there can be um, 
just more sensitivity to moving over seagrass beds with boats and propellers and anchors, I think you could find that all those things would be recolonised. Marine animals are actually surprisingly good at when they're given a break again, booming back into that environment because there's relatives of them out in open ocean uh, along the outside coast of, of Victoria and so they can migrate back into the system relatively easy. Their young are usually little floating babies in the plankton and as long as there's somewhere suitable to settle down, they'll settle and spread and, and recover very well. One of my dreams has always been to have as much wetland restored in the former Kui up swamp as it possible to do. So without getting onto anybody's farmland, we can say, well, let's put the roadside verges back under wetland. Let's put that bit of land that no one's doing anything with it back into wetland. Let's try to buy as much as we can of the top mile or three or four kilometres of land around the top end of the bay and let it become go back to being swamp, a little tiny ribbon of swamp. The problems are quite easily identifiable. They're not going to be easy to fix, but we have to do it. We caused them. It's up to us now.